Scalera Cordia August of Road. Welcome to be my guest with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media TV, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary, Clare's Wish Foundation in Limerick, and Deal Animal Rescue in West Limerick. And my wonderful guest today, um, uh, even though he's been described as being the controversial priest, is Father Iggy O'Donovan from the Glen of Aherlow in, uh, originally from the Glen of Aherlow in Tipperary. Hello, Father. Hello, uh, how are you? I'm grand. Um, do you know, uh, uh, do you prefer to be called Father or Iggy? Iggy will do fine. I've been called worse. <laughs> we won't call you yeah. anything. Yeah, okay. Do you like, does that sit well with you that um, the, I saw a lot of posts, you know, controversial priest, controver priest with controversial views. Uh, do you consider yourself controversial? I don't really. I, like I've had the most uh, traditional upbringing. I come from a family of 10, the foot of the Galtys. We were brought up in very traditional Catholicism and family rosaries and all that type of thing. I joined a very traditional religious order of the Augustinians. Augustinians, yeah. And my and my whole formation later was in theology, and that was in Rome. Yes, especially during the pontificate of John Paul II. Hardly the most radical of times to be in Rome. No, but, <laughs> no so well, I had. Pope John I had, Paul. I, I, Pope John Paul yes, was very yes. conservative. Yes. Well. I must say, I've met two saints, two officially canonized saints in my time, John Paul and Mother Teresa. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, sleepers. I mean, yes. what was it like? Now, I didn't think you were going to uh, go down that route, but what was it like when you met um, both of them, actually, but Mother Teresa? Did you meet well, her? Well, first? obviously, in, on both occasions, it would have been sort of for a sort of a fleeting moment, if you know what I mean. There yeah. would have been other people present and they shook your hand. But I did have supper with a group of people with John Paul once in 1982, I remember. He was still quite active and then going well. And uh, he came to supper one evening at the Augustinian headquarters in Rome and I was one of the guests. And I still recall he having a glass of red wine and an orange, an orange. And that was his meal for the evening. That was a strange red wine and, and an orange. Well, he, he somebody said to him, one of the people at the table, I remember an old Spanish brother said to him, Holy Father, if you don't eat something, you'll have to raid the fridge when you get back to the Vatican. And uh, John Paul, I remember, said in Italian, I don't eat much in the evening. So he sipped a little red wine and a nibbled at an orange. That's my memory. It's probably better off. Uh, sometimes oh, yeah. I don't think anybody probably they say should eat um, past six o'clock in the evening. So probably. Yeah. Well, this, very, this, this would have been. He was this a very. Would have been nine o'clock. <laughs> Sorry. This would have been nine o'clock actually. <laughs> oh, at the yeah. end of the day. You know, he was a very fit man, and he was a very he was a very sport orientated man all his life. So maybe that. Health um, carried through all his life. Do you oh, know what yeah. he was? But Father Iggy, um, at one stage you baptized. I, I remember reading about it. You baptized a child, and you allowed the godparents pour water over the baby's head, and you caused <laughs> massive controversy within the. Wait, within the actually, was not so much the godparents, but the parents. Yeah, why was the that? Why was that such a big deal, such that um, the parents were written to, the parents were contacted, and the baby had to be rebaptized? And by yes, a uh, and, uh, and uh, rebaptizing somebody is, in fact, heretical. It is heretical. You can only be baptized once, even if you're baptized by a Muslim or by a pagan or by a non believer. Baptism is valid. Okay? Yeah. So the in that case the parish priest in question rebaptized because the man didn't have a theological brain cell between his ears. Otherwise he wouldn't have done that. Your face re is re 
I think I think my great hero, my great hero of the ancient church, which I'm, you might, Augustine, Augustine, who is regarded as possibly the greatest mind in our theological history. One of his very strong points was you never rebaptize, never. I know. It is of, there once it says, and I know of situations. No, but, no, actually, what happened in this case? It was political. There was a group out that decided that this was a way of pulling the carpet from beneath me, and they succeeded, as they have with anybody who has questioned the system. Really, yes. You have tried. You, um, you, you were, you were moved after that. You were actually um, yes. moved after that, weren't you? How did yeah, that? Yeah, how did that sit? But how? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's always positives. You were moved to Limerick. I mean, yes, Limerick. Yes. You know, that's almost, I suppose, like a promotion for you when you were moved to Limerick. Well, I didn't do. I got on okay in Limerick, actually. And Why I was you? Near yeah, but uh, it wasn't so much where I was moved to as the fact that one was moved because of that which sort of shows the narrowness and the bigotry and the way things were done. I mean, it was appalling, really. But well, can, can I just say, I know of people, I, I have situations where grandparents or parents were worried about grandchildren who weren't baptised or weren't going to be baptised and actually yes. took it upon themselves to actually baptise the child um, in yes. the kitchen. Um, because they were actually scared stiff and they knew that the parents were against the baptism. Um, and yes. that, and from my um, meager knowledge, that would be considered a baptism. That child would be baptized. Yes. She yes. was baptized by a Catholic priest. She was baptized um, with the sign of the cross and she was baptized into the Catholic Church in good faith. Why was it so, do you think it was wholly um, uh, political and a way of getting rid of you? Well, obviously, it could have nothing to do with theology. It could have nothing to do with the sacrament. It couldn't. Um, I mean, Christ himself wasn't baptized by a Catholic priest. He was baptized by John the Baptist, who was a Jew. And so, therefore, um, if Christ's baptism was valid, this one should have been. And what did the family think? I mean, I know they were outraged when they found they were. out that they had they were. no they, idea, they had no idea that what was going on in the background. No, they, they simply they went along with what the parish police told them to do. They told me later that they had realized what was happening, they wouldn't have gone along. But they went along with what he told them to do. And you know, people yeah. For better or for worse, we've always in this country gone along with what parish priests told us, and not always in the wisest way. But what's done is done. I ask you, um, on they say there there are people who are probably um, well. I suppose you also were very outspoken when it came to the um, uh, equality referendum. Re referendum. Referendum. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And voting for same-sex marriage and you said that you were going to vote yes in the referendum um, yes and that as we know go goes against the pillars of of, of of the Catholic Church's ethos on marriage why yes. do you feel so compelled to um, to vote yes in the referendum Given that you are a theological um, priest, you're a, you're a theologian, you're a priest, you're an Augustinian, and you're you're yes. devoted, as you say, to the Catholic Church. Why yes. why do you find the rules of the Catholic? I'm asking now because I'm I'm putting the um, questions that other people might be thinking. Why are you so opposed to um, following rules of the Church that you actually joined? because of those rules, probably. No, I'm actually keeping to the rules of the church, the church that I joined. I am actually keeping to the rules. It's just that I, in voting a referendum, I was voting as an Irish citizen. Yeah. For my fellow citizens. And while I believed in Catholic marriage and so forth, I 
see this, and other people see this as a matter of civil rights for other citizens who don't happen to believe what I believe. So I will keep my Catholic beliefs, I will support them, but I will respect other people who have different views and are equally passionately held as mine, as yes. fellow citizens. Yes, but I was there voting are... in purely, purely secular matter. It was a legal secular matter. It had nothing to do with my personal faith at all, which I still hold on to. But, but there, I, are, I, there are people, Father, who would ask you the question um, by um, vote, voting the way you did, being that you are an Augustinian and a priest, that you are voting against what you have, what 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 the priesthood would teach, and what the church, the Catholic Church would teach, and therefore you're you're um, leaving the church open for um, for to be in some senses. Uh, well, you know, if the, if the church can change on this, they can change on that. And what are the you know all our lives we were told told you can't take the communion from the top of your mouth because it's a sin. Um, the prayers yeah. are constantly changing and you're there and you're saying to yourself there's there doesn't seem to be and a friend of mine her husband uh who's muslim said to me what the difference between why our our church he said is so strong and why the catholic church is failing he said is because uh, you don't have strict foundations and rules our he said our teachings are the same from day one to now, and we follow the, the the teachings rather than the teachings following us, and trying to bend to 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 our will rather than we following, um, uh, rather than the church becoming a strong foundational parent, if you like, that you have to follow the rules within the household. It's like the parent is giving way to the child all the time. So, what would you say to people who would say that that you're you're helping? By 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 doing that, by by going against the church, you're helping to weaken the church, or the teachings of the church. But I would repeat uh, that I have not gone against the teaching of the church. I have hold on to the teaching of the church on marriage, and so forth. I'm simply in. We were voting on a constitutional matter. Yeah. And. I was simply recognizing my fellow citizens who have a view different to mine and who see this as a civil right. I mightn't see it that way, but they do. So yes. I'm happy to keep my teaching, but I will not impose on other people something they don't wish to believe or wish to or don't follow. If the Muslims think that that should be done, and mind you, most Muslim societies are probably in the most intolerant places on earth. You go through any one of them. For example, there's not a Muslim democracy in the world anywhere, anywhere. As bad as we are, we have some form of democracy. Yeah. So that uh, I don't take the Muslims as being the ideal situation for anybody in almost any sense of the term. And certainly not when it comes to do with civil rights or rights of anybody. Yeah, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just, I suppose, being devil's advocate here because we yeah. have to produce a, a balanced um, uh, appro approach to this but in the case of the Catholic Church if if, if, it, if somebody wanted to get married with do you believe in, in in marriage being for everybody within the Catholic Church or just uh, as a structure within the the, gov the the legal system within our our, our our constitution and within within the country but what would happen now you know, for instance, with uh, same-sex uh, couples wanting to marry within the Catholic Church, would you be opposed or for? The same-sex marriage within the Catholic Church doesn't happen. You can't do it. It's not a Catholic marriage. I accept that. But for those who wish to have same-sex marriage outside the Catholic Church, I don't see it as my role to prevent them. Yeah. Particularly particularly there are fellow citizens who are not Catholics. Absolutely. And, yeah, and the idea that my view should be imposed upon them uh, is something that I, I, I simply don't go for. I simply don't. But I, I, 
I, I would hold on to my Catholic beliefs and I would hope that those sec secular people or others would respect my beliefs as well, just as I respect theirs. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's room for, there's room for, there's room for everybody. And don't ever forget, Jesus Christ was condemned to death for blasphemy. Blasphemy, believe it or not. You, um, you would therefore hold, uh, be a strong advocate for separating um, church and state? Yes, very much. Very much. And uh, because I think that it's a, what I would call it, when the throne and the altar come together like that, it's a suffocating embrace. A suffocating embrace. And I think the church must stand on its own feet, with its own believers, its own followers, and not to be... And church um, running the state and being involved intimately with the state, I have my reservations there all the time. And uh, we've had our record in this country has not been good in that area. Yeah. So, but having, uh, uh, having said that, Father, oh. with, um, there are many who would say that we fought in this country for many centuries for the, the right to an education, the right to use our, uh, the Irish language, to speak the Irish language, and That's the right true. to actually practice our faith. So when at the foundation of the state, the uh, religion, Catholic religion was incredibly important to people who had been denied it for so long. Um, that is and, true. That is and, true. And now uh, we have uh, uh, people, uh, you know, that there are those who would say that it's been whipped from us again, and especially COVID, COVID situation, and not being able to go into a church and practice your faith. Because it's one thing being able to look at mass on, 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 on Facebook or watch it online. It's another thing to receive the sacraments, to receive the sacrament of communion, confession. And you can't do that unless you're physically in a church. And uh, people, there are people who, um, who feel that the church is weakening in that. It's not strong enough. It's not... Uh, it's not demanding that people get back, uh, be allowed to practice their faith, irrespective of what faith you follow, whether you're a Muslim or a Protestant or or or, or any um, denomination, that you should be able to practice your faith in the in the pre the premises. And it seems like the church is letting some priests stand out uh, in protest and try to do something about it, and standing back. Um, and and not doing anything. I believe you actually are one of the latter priests that believes that the, the government is right to, uh, to 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 prevent masses at the moment for for health and safety reasons. What is your view? Yeah. Well, I we're in an unfortunate situation, and I particularly think the funerals. That's one of the areas where this is most felt, where the numbers are very small very small and uh, I think people probably have felt that more than any other aspect. I, I did a wedding last week for six people, six, just six people and um, they had 200 invited but they couldn't but they went ahead anyway. Uh, I, while I think it's unfortunate and I, I spoke about this actually on Easter Sunday. Yeah. I think, I think you may have come across some of my text Toward Easter Sunday, but I am happy to accept the advice of the medical and legal experts at the moment, like Dr. Houlihan and his friends. And if they advise me not to have um, religious services uh, as we had them before, I am happy for the moment to accept that. I think it's a short-term sacrifice. Hopefully, in a couple of months, it will be finished, and we'll be back. But, but why, in for the moment, I'm happy to accept it. Do you not think that the goalpost has been moved so many times, and and many people are getting frustrated because you know, I mean, for instance, you can go to a, a doctor, a hairdresser can go to uh, to her doctor, but that doctor can't go and get his hair done from the same hairdresser. Um, the, the the rules keep changing, and the churches and the 
and the idea that um, we had recently here at the um, the, the church in O'Connell Street, the um, Jesuits, it's run yes. by French priests now. Recently, there yes. was a group of people standing outside for, for um, the Tridentine Mass. And one uh, councillor um, uh, was hounding them, standing outside so, um, in the open air at, at safe distances, and she called the police. Uh, on them and the guardie on them and to me well to me there are no words for that woman that would be um decent um and secondly i mean the guardie didn't want to do anything quite quite frankly but uh, people should be, I, I, i'm a believer that people should be able to practice their 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 faith i mean we have st john's cathedral you know st john's cathedral would hold a mm -hmm, thousand yes. And yet they can't have mass on a Sunday, and it would never have a, a, a full house inside of mass. But I do sure. believe, and I do believe that, and maybe you 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 you'll think I'm wrong in this, but I do believe that the fact that we've been deprived of um, being able to practice to go into the church when we wanted to, people who may never have gone inside a church for years may be more inclined to go back after COVID because they've been, it's been prevented from them for so long. What do you think about that, Father? Well, um, I think it'd be a, the ban, if you like, will be short term. We're talking about maybe a, maybe a month or two more, in which case, hopefully, we'll be back to normal. And I think in the overall, the bigger picture of things and the enormous number of deaths and the enormous amount of sickness that while we have made a sacrifice, financially too, by the way, financially too, uh, it isn't a huge price. In, it isn't a huge price in the long term. In the long term. See, I disagree with you That's there. Right. I dis I I disagree with you there because I think yes, maybe many people will survive this and survive this. Uh, okay. But there is the the, de the long term effect on people's mental and emotional um, uh, well being, uh, their financial well being. Many people will have lost their businesses, they'll have lost their homes, they'll have lost sure. their families, they'll have lost their minds, and in some cases, people will have lost their lives because they just don't. And you wonder which is, you know, is it. What, which is the lesser of the two? Well, the difficulty is that just a year ago, this was all new to us. So we've been hit with something which we've never had before, in my lifetime anyway. And you know, it's a colossal, the virus has been a colossal learning experience, a very steep learning curve. I mean, I'm amazed at how fast the vaccines have come through. I thought it would be years. They have, they have moved very fast. And I, am hope, I appreciate the sacrifices that have been made. You just mentioned some of them there. Businesses and hairdressers and bars and restaurants and everything. But there so, are sacrifices that will never be, uh, people will never recover from. I mean, the government, but, the government isn't losing a penny. They're not losing a penny in wages. And if they were, perhaps we'd, we'd opened up a lot quicker. Dr. Houlihan isn't losing a penny by any of this. In fact, they've got, they've, they've taken rises in their wages. Meanwhile, an average shop can't, or a hair salon, or a, a clothes shop, or a sweet shop can't open. And that's an awful lot to be expecting one group of people to sacrifice at the same time. And people, elderly, who had just their mass to go to every morning to sit inside quietly maybe not speak to another person but see them inside i think yeah. i think looking at at the royal wedding or the royal funeral the other day brought it home as well to me that no matter who you are watching the queen sitting there on her own head bowed nobody allowed next to her to sit and even hold her hand i thought it was immoral that, that, that a woman uh, uh, of 95 years of age should be left sitting alone without a, a, a solitary being 
comfort her while her hu husband of 75 years was being buried. And it's the same all over Ireland and all over, it, 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 you know, certainly all over Ireland. I just, I, I don't agree um, with, with the sanctions. I think they're unrealistic to expect. What is it? How many? 32 of a funeral? In Ten, Ireland? actually. 10. 10 to a funeral mm. in Ireland. That, that, that's ludicrous. We're, we're known for our funerals. They're, they're, they're social events in this country. And the church is well, doing, the church should be, in my view, the, that priest in Cavan, he's been left stand out to hang out to dry. Well, uh, who I sympathize with here myself are the Garda, for example. I know the last thing on earth the guard I want to do is to be entering houses of worship, telling people to desist. I, I think they find it, they, it's the last thing they wish to do. And it's putting them in the most invidious position. But um, I'm also concerned, you mentioned the priest in Cavan, Father Hughes, I think is the name. Yeah, yeah. He, speaking about uh, Oliver Cromwell, speaking about penal laws. I think that's emotive language, uh, very pejorative terms, Oliver Cromwell and penal laws, and comparing Michal Martin to Oliver Cromwell and Dr. Houlihan's directives to penal laws. I, I think that's emotive and I think actually damages our case. But there are, so, there are many who would actually share his views that uh, not since penal laws have people been prevented from actually congregating to, to celebrate uh, their, their 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 faith or to practice their faith. So I presume is your argument then I not follow where you're going here. Is your argument then that there should be no closed down at all? Well, I don't think that uh, personally. I don't. I you know, it's just a personal view. I don't see the logic of ten at a funeral. I don't see the logic of people not being able to go into St John's Cathedral and celebrate Mass when. That it wouldn't even be a, a, a fifth or an, an, an eighth full. Um, I think it yeah. should be dependent on the size of the church per square meter that, that people spread out inside the church. And I'm sure the priests um, inside in Mass are quite capable of saying to people, you sit here and you sit here and you sit here and keep people spaced out. But the idea that it, it, you cannot go into a church um, it just seems to me um, counterproductive and it's going to come back, um, I believe, it's going to come back to haunt people um, later on um, because people lose their trust. If, if, uh, gradually, people are starting to get disinterested in following these instructions. That's what I think because you can do it for so long and you, if you were told, oh, it would be a year and it'll be over on the next year on a certain date. But the goalpost, what was to be te uh, uh, two weeks, ends up a year, nearly a year and a half. And there's no signs. And and I, I just think that the church is, it, the, the church for the most part, the bishops, the cardinals, they're not doing enough, I don't think, to actually um, say, look, VA matches can, could be back. Rugby matches could be back. They could go into scrums, but a, a poor misfortunate old woman or old man can't go into mass and sit in their own side of the church. It, there's no logic in my well, view. Hopefully, ho hopefully it's a temporary little arrangement, I think. And hopefully within a few weeks, we'll be back. That's the, oh. the way I see it. Well, hopefully, and, hopefully, I just th personally think that it's just going on way too long and it's expecting too much of uh, of too many. Um, but yet, um, the people who are making these rules are not um, are not subject to the same um, financial restrictions at all. If anything, they have uh, they seem to have benefited. But uh, to, on a more positive note, Father. You, um, the, you were um, in Drogheda, and it was in Drogheda that you um, were actually um, chastised for baptizing or allowing the, the, the father and mother to 
pour water over the child and yes for it but yet you received their highest honor and it's a, it's a town of 40 40 thousand um, yes it's a, a, well, it's, when you say the highest honor I, I i take it you're referring to the freedom of the borough yeah freedom of the borough i did and the last churchman before me to get that was john paul <laughs> and, 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 so and, you're and all he did open into their eyes in fact i was i was somewhat flattered when i looked at the list charles parnell john paul ii eamon de valera oh, well. <laughs> uh, yes so I, I was somewhat flattered Neil, uh, you should about and um, john paul ii you should probably be uh, absolutely flattered about as well yeah, yeah. um uh, but um yeah but you're in limerick what are you in the augustinians here in limerick father no i, I i've actually left limerick i'm in feathered in tipperary now yeah feathered do like tipperary it? do you like it there yeah very quiet uh, i'm sort of you know, especially now in the, in the in the lockdown, there's very little happening. I do. I'm involved a bit in the school as, as well here, I, which I enjoy, and I, I dabble in the school and I visit the Glen of Arthur Low and it's great. It's also a great horse country. I'm not a great horseman, but it's great horse country here. Yeah. And, uh, well, it more is. Buried all. And with what's her name winning the uh, the Grand National the other day at, at, at yes, Rachel Blackmore. Rachel, and yes. I don't follow um, uh, horse racing at all, but we interviewed Rachel here, and she was lovely. And I watched it as she was winning. Um, up yep. up to, the, I had no interest in horse racing, but it was just such a great joy uh, for Man. for. For Munster, because it's an it's a, a Limerick horse, a Waterford trainer, and a Tipperary jockey. Yes. Well, I've often said that we have many here in this area of feathered. We have many, many millions worth of flesh, equine. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. My grandfather. I told you off camera. My grandfather. My mother's mother was he was a pa he was patrick o'dwyer from i think tipperary town but a it friend sounds, of, yes. friend of mine then he's um his grand uncle was dan breen my fight for irish dan, freedom. Yes, yes yes well i all i do know is that for our house in our law for more than 40 years dan breen always got the number one vote <laughs> he was he did. He would have. He would have given the Sacred Heart a run for his money in our house. <laughs> so, so instead of the John F. Kennedy photograph and the Sacred Heart, it was Dan Breen and the Sacred Heart. Yes, Dan, Dan, Breen, Dan Breen was our number one for many decades, all his life. Every number one vote in the house went to him. Yeah, but that's why when you look at people like that, like Dan Breen and Padraig Pierce and all of those who fought for independence of this country and fought for so much in this country and you think that people are just sitting by and allowing us not uh, people who are wanting to go to to mass i mean you know there's people as i say who didn't darken the door of a church but now you hear them saying things like that was different when you knew you could walk in at any stage now you know you can't and you're being told not to to be told not to do something is is worse than actually making the choice yourself and I think it's a stubbornness in the Irish. Um, people who never wanted to go to Mass now want to go because they were, they're being told not to. Well, just... I would, but I would think and I would hope it would be a temporary little arrangement. And that if people want to go back, they'll have their chance. What made you decide to be a priest? What was it that drew you to the priesthood? And why are you at... Um, have have you found yourself at odds with a lot of the teachings of the church and the traditional teachings because i know you believe that the traditional church is in your own words all but gone um do you really believe well, that one day uh, traditional 
church that I grew up in is all but gone. I only look around me, and I see it. And uh, it does, doesn't mean the church is gone. Yes. The particular model in which I grew up is largely dead, very largely dead. Now, what if it be replaced by, I'm not 100% sure, but I am one of those who strongly believes that Catholicism can be adapted to modernity. The basic truths of Catholicism don't change, namely the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord. That remains fixed. But the world in which it's preached is changing all the time. All the time. And we've got to move along with it because the model out of which we have operated has worked for a while. It's finished now. Finishing. Well, what again would you say to people who say um, that's like, uh, and it's back to what I said earlier, that's like a mother and a father, a mother role or that, and disciplinarian or um, you you have your rules and the children uh, know their boundaries and, and, and know what they can do and what they can't do. That by by bending so much and trying so much to be cool and and um, and modern, modernity isn't always um, the best. Sometimes people need to know our boundaries and, and need to know. I mean, I'm not talking about being overly strict like the Catholic Church was um, and, and, and certainly was. But now you go into Mass and you can take the communion in your hand, um, which yes. was a sin before. It was a sin if you actually, you were trying to get the, the communion, if it was stuck to the roof of your mouth, you were there for the whole Mass trying to get it out, off with your tongue because you were afraid to put your hand in because it was a sin. Um, and and the, you go to Mass and the the... the the prayers are being, the wording is being slightly changed and you're uh, all the time. And you're saying like, and I love the Tridentine Mass. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love the mystique. I'm into pomp and ceremony as a person. I, yeah. That's what I love about the royal family. I love the pomp, the ceremony. Philip's funeral the other day was just glorious to watch from the, the, the perspective of pomp and ceremony. And with the Tridentine Mass, the, 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 the Gregorian chanting, the, the Latin that, okay, you don't know what, what's been said in Latin unless you actually understand Latin. But if you went to Germany and France and you went to Mass there, you'd be listening to it in German and you'd be listening to it in French. You still don't understand it. Where as the Tridentine uh, in my view, becomes almost um, a universal language within the church that I can't understand why it was taken away by, as you said, your hero, uh, John Paul, uh, John the 23rd, who took away, John the 23rd, yes. you know, took away the, 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 the Latin mass. And my mother used to grieve terribly, she used to say. What did uh, John take away the Latin Mass for? We loved the Latin Mass. And I can see what why she would, because in every country, it was the same. It gave you time to meditate. It's almost like you listen to uh, Judaic prayers and you listen to the call to prayer in Islam and you listen to the Tridentine. It's that, 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 that meditative sound that gives you the time and or the space to actually uh, be at one with your own thoughts, if, even if you don't. But what understand. I would, what I, my own belief is that it ought not to have been taken away. The new vernacular, bring it in by all means. But for those who wanted the Tridentine Latin Mass, I would have given them the option of having it. Yeah. In fact, I would have yeah. had both. I would have had yeah. both. Yeah, and that's why I think that church up there, the Jesuits, is becoming popular again. Um, okay, the young priests are doing so much to try and revitalize the Tridentine Mass. And it's yes. just lovely and relaxing to listen to the, to listen to the, 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 the chants and, and to listen to the... the my mom, when she was buried, when she was her funeral, her Mass was in Irish... English and Latin 
and it was mm -hmm. on scene. It was um, Canon Willie Fitzmaurice who, who who said the mass, and half yes. of it was a very good, a very a very good horror of his time. That's what I was about to say. Half the lads were ex hurlers or were hurlers. Yes. There was I didn't think Willie knew, knew Latin, but that's the way she wanted it was and. Many of them said afterwards that it was the first time they felt they had been at mass in a long time or ever because they hadn't grown up with the Latin mass. They were my age. and But they felt that they were at something different, something spiritual, because it, were, it, it sounded spiritual. It was a time they could actually just think and not have yeah. to listen. You know? Yeah. Well, I think there's room for both. And um, I, for one, would have welcomed the vernacular and uh, the massive data in the language of the people. But for those who want to be other, I wouldn't have taken it away from them. That was a, I believe that was an error. The choice yeah. should have been there. I think I, I think it was uh, was an error, but at least it, it, it's coming back. Um, uh, it, at least it's coming back. But you think that the church in its own form has to bend to the people? the will of the people well I, I guess you you'd be all for women priests i would <laughs> in, in the, i i i would I, in that uh, they would at least have done as good a job as i've done and uh, the half hour i think we're breathing in one lung not having women priests and uh, I, I have no problem, uh, really, I, I can't see what the difficulty is. And uh, those who argue that Christ didn't ordain women, mm. well, very quickly, anybody with a modicum of history will know that Christ was operating in the Judaic Roman world, which was a totally patri patriarchal society. And there's no way that he would have, in fact, Christ didn't ordain anybody. Christ was a Jew. And but the uh, idea that it could only be something done by a group of males exclusively for all time and forever, that's something I fail to understand, simply fail to understand. And I think, I think we're, we're, the loss is ours, the loss is ours, I do believe. I've said that for many years. What would be your view? Well Again, there are people who would say, well, you know, if you have married priests or you have women priests and and um, and women are married and, and men are married and they go into the church. I know a lot of Anglican priests who converted at one stage, yes. brought families with them, but Catholic uh, sure. or they, Catholic priests like you can, cannot marry, um, which in my view is wrong i mean it should be one rule for one and one rule for all why should you not be allowed to marry but yet somebody can bring their wife as an anglican minister and can convert but the choice you then that it's, it's purely priest. illegal it's, it's purely illegal it's not a, it's not a doctrinal matter but i mean uh, no... from a simple point of view with me they they became catholics that's one thing but they also became priests. They they held on to their priesthood, even though it took you about seven years to train as a priest. Yes. And that, to me, is jars with me. As somebody whose father's side of the family are entirely Protestant, my father's people were uh, church, uh, church of England, mostly all Methodist and uh, Welsh Methodist and um, but I think that how can somebody come in who is a, an Anglican priest and become a priest in the Catholic Church when it took you seven years to become a priest and he can have, bring his wife and children with him but you can't marry. Yes. Well uh, it shows that the party shows that as I said to you a moment ago it shows that you're not dealing with a doctrinal matter. It's nothing to do with doctrine. It's purely a disciplinary matter, which could be changed tomorrow if the authorities so chose. So um, I see that as a a relatively minor one compared to the women priests. But why is the church so reluctant to 
to move on women priests and to move on priests being married. Do you think it's for financial reasons that, you know, I mean, if, if Father Iggy decided to get married in the morning, Father Iggy, and Father Iggy was, uh, uh, the church decided to move Father Iggy to um, uh, the deep, dark, uh, as darkest places in the world, you know, like M Mongolia, out of Mongolia or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. Not so easy for a wife to be brought and children to be taken out of school logistically. There are people who would say that um, how can you how can that happen? How can families function if a priest by your nature are constantly being moved from parish to parish, uh, city to city, country to country? And the children no, no, it's a, yeah, it, it, it's a it, it's a real issue, but as I said, the, the important thing is that it's a cultural thing. It's something that grew up, something that grew up over the, like for the first thousand years of the church, it didn't exist at all, except for monks and people of that sort. But when it did become uh, mandatory, only in the Middle Ages, so we got on without it. We got on without it for a thousand years. So, uh, it's, it's not a major matter of theology or doctrine. In fact, it's irrelevant to those things. It's uh, purely, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's, especially talking to young people, I think our street credibility loses greatly on that particular score. Like, like they find it, at one time it was seen as, you were know, seen as a heroic sacrifice or making sacrifices and so forth. I think many young people today would see it as a bit, quite frankly, a bit weird. Something not right. But does that make it wrong? Because young people today think that it's not natural. I mean, uh, people who would would be members of an enclosed order of, of of nuns would feel that it was absolutely the most natural thing in the world for them. To yes, and. Yeah, but you, you see here, you, you're making one little error here, I think. You must make a distinction between vowed religious. If, if tomorrow morning, if tomorrow morning, the celibacy was abolished, yeah, it wouldn't in the slightest affect vowed religious like the Augustinians, like the Carmelites, like the enclosed nuns that you referred to. They would yeah. continue to be, to be celibate. And the difference is where it is mandatory for the whole church yes and that is the big difference so therefore the enclosed carmelites or anybody else it wouldn't affect them at all they would continue as they are it's back but to what other, said, it's back to what you said about the tridentine allow people the choice yes that, i think that's the key point that is the key point if somebody but, wants but, to remain celibate they'll remain celibate or they'll join a, a celibate order. And, um, Absolutely, yes. If, if they're so wish, if they're so wish. Yeah. If they're so wish, yes, true. But... Um, what was the journey... I would, I would have a choice there. What was I the journey... Have, 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 sorry? There's a, a pause, you see, in, in, in us speaking. There's a, a delay on the, on the signal. But what was your journey to priesthood? Um, and have you had any regrets? Oh, yeah. Like sometimes people ask me, if you were starting off again, would you do it again? Very hard to say. Like what my initial, what initially, my initial interest in priesthood was actually to be an Augustinian missionary. In Africa, and the missionaries were seen as, if you like, the stormtroopers on the frontier. But I have never done that. I've spent much of my life in the academic world, actually. Yeah. A teacher of history and that type of stuff. And uh, most of my life in Ireland, I did teach history in Rome for a few years. But, uh, but my initial spur, and it would have been quite common in my childhood, and young people around me, 
uh, missionaries, Irish missionaries were seen as heroes. Today, our Irish missionaries got up to, and the type of church they brought to Africa and Asia and so forth, is much more questioned, mm. much more questioned. And uh, whereas what would have been seen as the stormtroopers on the frontier are now very much seen as a, brought a European model of church and maybe, in fact, in the long term, may have done damage. It's seen differently now. But your motivation for remaining as a priest changes as time goes on. Like what initially attracted me wouldn't attract me today at all in any what sense of that term. What initially attracted you? Possibly the, the whole idea of mission, I think, going through missions. That was one. That was almost definite. And the idea of being an Augustinian missionary, that was the attraction when I was 13 or 14. It was certainly wouldn't attract me now. No way. No. And, uh, but I suppose I'd say would. Would you, uh, for the would you have regrets to the point that you would say to yourself, if I had my time back again, I wouldn't have been a priest? There are times you would say that, but then if you had chosen any career, you'd probably be saying that too. Yeah. What, what was I doing all my life as a garbage sergeant or as a, you know? Yeah, at least you'd have had more options, Father. At least you'd be able to marry and to have children. You, you gave up a yeah. lot to become a priest and to become a missionary priest that you didn't end up becoming. Life took you in a different direction. Um, yes. Would it, do, you, do you think it would be easier for priests to remain priests and remain true to their uh, priesthood if they were allowed to marry? Some of them, yes. Like many of the ones I know that have left, by and large, they have left to marry. And the pity, I think, is that some of them are perhaps the people of greatest initiative and ability. Yeah. And that, that, that is, I think, it's an enormous loss to the church. In fact, there's a very good case for the very large number of married priests out there to allow them to resume their ministry if they wanted to, especially at a time when uh, the number of vocations is very small and you simply look around you. By and large, you, 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 very next few years, you're going to be heading many more empty churches, many more. And especially that's when... Staring, that's staring us straight in the face. I grew up listening to my mother saying, once a priest, always a priest. She always had that saying, that even if a priest, yep. a priest stood, because he was ordained, he was a, a priest for life. And uh, yep. even married, he was a priest, he was still a priest for life. So that is uh, what you just said about uh, there being an opening for allowing married priests to, to still perform their, their, um, uh, their priestly duties. Yeah. Uh, and still celebrate mass because they were ordained and irrespective of how, whether they got married or had a relationship afterwards they were still ordained priests yeah. and besides besides it happens to be a fact that in certain parts of the world would be particularly true latin america mexico and that which is the biggest catholic area in the world that the number of priests there who are in relationships is probably in the great majority Really? Yes. Yes. And life goes on. What do you think? Um, I'm, told, I'm told the figure might be as high as 70%, I'm told. Wow. <laughs> and, and how does that actually sit with the likes of priests, say, in here in Ireland, who see that happening um, and, and see the Protestants, say, the Church of Ireland ministers coming and bringing their wives and children? How does it that um, sit with priests? Oh, I have like no them? doubt. I have no doubt for some of them it's demoralizing. For some of them it's demoralizing. But it happens to be a fact. And I have known this for decades. Even when I was in my formation in Rome, some of my colleagues from Brazil and Mexico and that often told me that. Often. And still and you went and still you 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 went forward. I did, yes, I did. But uh, perhaps I'm a person of very little imagination. <laughs> I doubt that very much. 
I'd say you were, I'd say you were one of these people who was a very deep thinker, who, who thought a, a, a very philosophical thinker. I'd say you, you weren't somebody who accept, I'm a bit like that, you know, um, who fight, rails against uh, conformity um, and doesn't like to be told what to do and, and, and is a bit able to think for themselves. And I'd say you were very much uh, well, I did my my younger days. I, I did spend a few years in UCD, and I remember being the same time as one lad I got on well with. Actually, he went on to become a well-known writer later, Roddy Roddy Doyle. Oh, Roddy Doyle! Oh, wow. The same year, and Fintan fin, Fintan O'Toole. And I remember being in the I, 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 the Council for Civil Liberties and things like that with those people. And they were amazed that I had anything to do with the church. But so therefore, I picked up some of my ideas along the way there. And I was trained as, actually as a historian, which is something I have never quite dropped. Yeah. Yeah, but don't you think when you train as a historian, my, my PhD was English literature, but it was historical literature. Don't you think you become this critical thinker and it never, you're trained, in critical thought and, 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 yes. and analysis, and it never leaves you. You're, you, you spend, you could argue that it's a form of paranoia because you can never accept what's written. It's like Derrida that says there's no, there's, there's no truth in anything that's written because everything that's written can be reinterpreted and every reading of, of a text can be different with every reading. Even, even if it's different each time you read it and you see something else. So there's no truth in any text. Yes, and that is, that is particularly true of the scripture. Yeah. That the, the way we read it today is very different to the way it was read a hundred years ago. Today and with we, we have a, and I have what I call historical, historical critical approach, which, if you like, it makes it wear a hair shirt. It doesn't wear uncomfortably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Do you find it difficult now with the scandals that's been in the priesthood and that to, uh, to um, does it sit badly with you? Um, it does. It does. Well, if what it has done is it has demythologized a great deal about the priesthood. But, um, like we were on a moral, if you like, a moral pedestal. Now we find that many of these great heroes of ours had feet of clay, or worse, and but, we're paying a price for that now. But you think and particularly that in this country, particularly in this country, where the Irish Church was a model of anti-sexual terrorism, the Irish Church particularly, the others yeah. weren't, the others weren't, the Italians and others weren't as bad. We were, and uh, yet to be found ourselves, if you like, with our hand in the accountant put his hand in the till, so to speak. As, a, as an historian, uh, why do you think that that was so um, prevalent, say, in the Irish Catholic Church as opposed to any other? What is it about the Irish uh, Church that made that so prevalent? Was it society? Was it this, this, the... It was, it was society, it was culture. The, post-famine Ireland, where... We, was we, it the we, sense we, of power they were given? The priests suddenly had, after having nothing, they, they had, they, they grew up with, uh, after the famine, before the famine, all that, that, that era, with nothing. Suddenly, they were running the, the country. Uh, suddenly, they were omnipotent. Suddenly, they had this sense of... They were, and they, they, I suppose one can't overgeneralize. Yes. But we we had, if you like, Victorian morality mixed with Roman rules and regulations. And if when the two came together, it was a lethal cocktail. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Victorian morality with um, with, with, then with the raw, with the, particularly the Roman rules and regulations, which the Romans themselves didn't take very seriously, but we did. We applied a Victorian morality to it. And for example, we take censorship in this country. Censorship. 
of literature. It was the, the list of banned books was almost an index to the world's great literature. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, but it's also happening today, Father. I mean, if you look to the States and you see books um, like Little House and the Prairie and uh, Gone with the Wind and all of these great uh, uh, books or, or, um, or um, and Bean, or they're looking to, to erase history by, get, by burning the books, getting rid of the books, refusing to allow... I personally feel that um, everything should be read, but read in context and read and read within classrooms and used as discussions about what it was like, say, for instance, for the Catholic Church in 1845 that, uh, or uh, 1916, or what it was like, um, say, in, 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 in America in the South in the 1800s. You know, it's uh, we can't wipe history out by 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 trying to remove the books. It still happens. Yeah. We can ignore it all we like and pretend it didn't happen and and live in a bubble, but that only makes us ignorant. That you know, we're never going to learn about racism, about intolerance, about um, injustice within the Catholic Church unless we actually read and find out why people thought like that. Why society was like that? Yeah, but anyway, there we are. And uh, look, I have to go now. And look, it's been good to talk to you, uh, Mary. And hopefully you got something from it. I got lots from it, Father. You're an inspiration. Okay. You're an absolute... Okay. Well, thank, well, thank you, Father, for um, uh, chatting with me today. Uh, it, was, it was an absolute pleasure. And okay. Up Tipperary. Okay, God bless. In Dereleshem Klar, that's the end of the show for today. Until the next time, Lacoon of Day. Walam Tugaler Chiakana, Sonas Agas Graw, Agas Gadeshi Flon, 